appreciate having each of you with us today. Today we want to take an opportunity to talk about something that concerns each of us, and that's self-control. In James the third chapter, verse two, all of us make a lot of mistakes. If someone doesn't make any mistakes when he speaks, he would be perfect. He would be able to control everything he does. And of course, James, in speaking about this, makes it clear that one of the big problems that most have as far as self-control is concerned is in speech. Uh, we tend to let our tongue sometimes be engaged before our mind is, and usually gets us into problems when that happens. So that's one of the areas of, of uh, our concern about self-control, but that's not the primary one that uh, under consideration today, at least as far as my intentions are concerned. God uses what we provide for him. Not everything that we do, not every effort that we make is the things that God would like for it to be, but it's the things that we do have and it's the abilities that we do have. And those are the things that, that are put out there. So God is the one who makes the choice, however, in the things that take place. In Romans the ninth chapter, verse 15, for example, God said to Moses, I will be kind to anyone I want to. I will be merciful to anyone I want to. So it's not a matter of whether we want to be God to be merciful to us or, or how we want God to deal with us. The Lord tells us that he's going to deal with us in his own way. He's going to approach us in exactly the fashion in which he intends to. And it's not going to be a matter of uh, what our desires or what our thoughts are or whatever the things that we have. We, we have to accept what he provides and what he intends for us to do. In Romans 9, 16, therefore God's choice does not depend on a person's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. So it's not a matter of what we desire God to do. Uh, it's up to us to be what God wants us to be because he's going to approach it from, from that particular standpoint. Human desire and effort don't make the difference. Uh, we need to have the right desires. We need to make the right decisions. We need to do things in the right way. But God is going to deal with it in his way according to his decisions and the ideas and the thoughts that he has as opposed to those that we have. And I think that we pretty well understand this, but the, the reality is, is that there isn't any power other than God. Many people think of the fact that, that I don't think we really think truthfully about the amount of power that God has. And it gives us an example in the 13th chapter of the Roman letter, in the, the first verses there, uh, every person should obey the government in power. No government should exist if it hadn't been established by God. The governments that exist have been put in place by God. So God, God is the one that's in control. The governments that we have, whether we like them or not, they are essentially there because God wants them to be. God's not interested in there being anarchy here on the earth. He has made his decisions about the way things are supposed to be, and he has put uh, everything into motion to produce that. But it's necessary for us to be participants in what goes on as well. So this is where self-control comes in. And Paul gives us a, an example here in the ninth chapter of Romans that oftentimes is misunderstood, both in the, the times when it's read about, uh, in the Old Testament as well as in the New. Uh, the situation that existed with Pharaoh in Egypt and the statements that are made by, and particularly by the King James Version, that says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And many look at this and, and understand it from the standpoint that Pharaoh had no choice. He had to do what God wanted him to do, and so he just refused to let the Israelites go. Well, so we need to take a look at, at Romans 9 and, I, and See what exactly the scriptures have to say. And in verses 17 and 18, for example, scripture says to Pharaoh, I put you here for this reason, to demonstrate my power through you and to spread my name throughout the earth. 
Therefore, if God wants to be kind to anyone, he will be. If he wants to make someone stubborn, he will. What happened with Pharaoh was, and I think that here again is a mistaken idea that many people have. Somehow or other, it doesn't seem to communicate that all mankind is subject to God and that whether you are a Christian or whether you are a Jew, whatever system you might be under, you can transgress what God wants done and that makes you a sinner. But that's true of everyone. Pharaoh was just as much under the control of God and under the direction of God when he sent Moses and Aaron to him as any of the Israelites were. He was responsible to do what his mind told him he should do, what the example that was put before him or the teaching that was presented to him. When Moses uh, put his rod down and it became a serpent, and then of course the Pharaoh's magicians were able to duplicate to a degree that and some of the others as well. But the reality is, is that God gave sufficient demonstration to Pharaoh that he was God and that he was in control. And Pharaoh is the one who made a decision. In the ninth chapter, again, this time verse 34, uh, this time Exodus, when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials continued to be stubborn. The point that's made here is that Pharaoh had a choice to make just as men today have to make. And the fact that they are stubborn doesn't make the difference. God does not have to condescend to an individual because they are stubborn. He has to deal with them as sinners. And that is precisely the way that God dealt with Pharaoh. God says, I'm going to use the way Pharaoh is, I'm going to use that to prove who I am. But it was not because Pharaoh did not have the option to choose to do what God said. God simply knew what Pharaoh's reaction was going to be. And he says, I'm going to choose that to accomplish my own purpose. And Paul in the New Testament, and the Roman letter tells us that all things work together for good to those that are called that love God who are called according to his purposes. So this has always been true. God is able to use the things that happen in individuals' lives to accomplish his purposes. And that's precisely what would happen with Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a choice. James 1, 13 and 14 tells us, when someone is tempted, he shouldn't say that God is tempting him. God can't be tempted by evil. And God doesn't tempt anyone. Everyone is tempted by his own desires as they lure him away and trap him. It was Pharaoh's decision. It was his own desires that caused him not to want to let the children of Israel go. And so after all of the different examples were given, the various plagues were placed on Egypt. And Pharaoh then refused. His heart was stubborn. He refused to let the Israelites go. God has said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said, no. So it was not God that was causing Pharaoh to do this. God was telling Pharaoh what he needed to do, and Pharaoh was saying, I'm not going to do it. Same thing that happens today with individuals. God's word says, obey my commands. Man says, I'll do what I want to do. God says, I've given you that choice, just as he gave Pharaoh. Pharaoh made his choice, and there were consequences. God gives us that choice today. We make our choice, and when it's contrary to God's will, there are consequences. No change. God has not changed through the years. In Exodus 9 and verse 12, but the Lord made Pharaoh stubborn so he wouldn't listen to Moses and Aaron as the Lord had predicted to Moses. And so God used the stubbornness of Pharaoh 
to do and to prove what he wanted, to show the nations of the world. And as you read through the Old Testament in the various books, you see that the knowledge of what happened to Pharaoh had spread throughout the world at that time. People far away from Egypt knew what God had done with Pharaoh in Egypt. So God accomplished the purpose that he intended to, not because he forced Pharaoh to resist, but because he knew Pharaoh would, and he used it to accomplish his own purposes. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, make no mistake about this. You can never make a fool out of God. Whatever you plant is what you harvest. If you plant in the soil of your corrupt nature, you will harvest destruction. But if you plant in the soil of your spiritual nature, you will harvest everlasting life. So what we are faced with here is, as Paul tells us in Galatians, the life that you live is going to produce the kind of results that take place in your life. We've talked many times about the 90-10 principle that 90% of what takes place in your life is the result of only 10% of what actually has happened. But what we do with the 10% of our lives that we cannot control produces the 90% that we can. So when things don't go like we feel like they should, if we look at it, we will probably find that the problem lies with the decisions that we have made. Pharaoh's problem came God gave him his instruction. Pharaoh says, I'm not accepting that. And God said, fine. Here are the consequences that go with that, ultimately leading to the destruction of the entire army of Egypt. So consequences come about. Now in the 19th verse of 9, there is another story that we deal with. And self-control, once again, is the basic fundamental thing that underlies all of this, the decisions that the individual makes. You may ask me, why does God still find fault with anyone? Who can resist whatever God wants to do? The biggest problem with translation is the fact that getting across what is actually being said is very difficult. In the by translating this basically on the basis of what the words are that are there, you don't get the implication of what's actually being said. What's being said here basically is, what's God's business in interfering in my life? Why should God find fault with anyone? We do what we want to do, so why should God find fault with that? He gave us the right to make choices we can do what we want to do. So why should God find fault with that? In the next two verses, you get the answer. Who do you think you are to talk back to God like that? Can an object that's made say to its maker, why did you make me like this? A potter has the right to do whatever he wants with his clay. He can make something that's a special occasion or something for everyday use from the same lump of clay. The situation basically is this. We don't have the right to question God about what he does or how he does things or the fact that we say, well, that's not fair. No, there is no question of God on that basis. Christianity is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. It is a system in which God is the head. He is the potter. He takes the clay and he makes what he wants to from the clay. The clay's responsibility is to be what it's made to be. If it's made as a water jug, it's a water jug. The fact that it wants to be a wine container doesn't make any difference. The fact is it's a water jug. And the problem that man has is he says, I don't want to be a water jug. I want to be what I want to be. And what right do you have to make me be that? And the right is God made the jug. And that's what it has to be. And when we question that, when we go against it, when we challenge God, we do the same thing that Pharaoh did. God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, I'm not. 
Now, I'm not going to do it. You're not going to tell me what to do. I'm Pharaoh, and I will decide what's going to take place. And God said, fine. Here are the consequences. And mankind does the same thing today. Job been talking about it in the 10th chapter in verses 8 and 9. Your hands formed me and made every part of me. Then you turned to de destroy me. Please remember that you made me out of clay and that you will return me to the dust again. So Job recognized that he was made by God and that he was whatever he was. And his feeling was that he was, again, he was challenging God. He said, you've made me what I am and you're going to destroy me because of the things that had taken place. And ultimately, of course, Job makes the mistake in the last couple of chapters of challenging God. And God just asked him, he said, all right, you're so smart. Here are some questions that you need to answer. And Job's final statement was, I put my hand over my mouth, basically saying, I've said too much. This is where we need to recognize we are. When we begin to question the fact of why God does the things he does, why he requires the things that he does, people take the approach, and we'll use baptism as a quick example. People oppose baptism, immersion. Why? Because it's inconvenient. Because it's, it's easier just to put a cross with water on your forehead or pour a little water on your head or sprinkle a little water on you or maybe pour a little bit of water on your head. That's a lot easier than putting somebody into the tank and immersing them or the river or the creek or whatever. It's easier to do it that way. So, since I think it's easier and it's more expedient, and to me it means the same thing, then why not do it that way? But God didn't say, you have the choice. He said, immerse. And man says, like Pharaoh, no, I'm going to do it my way. And you're going to accept it because that's the way I want to do it. And the Lord says, fine. You made your choice, the consequences are there. So men have to recognize that we have to exercise self-control, and that control has to be controlled the way God has said that it's to be. I have to control myself. I don't have the right to tell God what I want to be or what I don't want to do or what I want to do or how I want him to handle it. That's not up to me. He has told me what he wants and what he expects, and that's what I have to do. In 2 Timothy 2.20, the Apostle Paul approached it this way. In a large house there are not only objects made of gold and silver, but also those made of wood and clay. Some objects are honored when they are used, others aren't. In other words, some of the God's creations are, are honored in particular ways. Uh, some of, we'll use men as examples. Some men are honored in this life. Some men have tremendous capabilities. In the men's class, we talked today about the individuals like Barnabas and the Apostle Paul. Two men that were totally different in many ways. Barnabas was not a, a highly educated man, but he was an individual that saw the good in everybody. The Apostle Paul was highly educated, very capable in the things and the ways in which he did, and yet the bottom line was that he had a very low patience level with people like John Mark. John did, Mark didn't do what Paul thought he ought to do, and so he didn't want to have anything to do with him. But Barnabas did. Barnabas saw the good and the possibilities that were there. The reality is, is that some individuals are more capable than others. Some are more attractive than others. All of these are incidentals these are just what we are and what we have to do is to recognize who we are second corinthians 6 17 and 18 the lord says get away from unbelievers separate yourselves from them have nothing to do with anything unclean then i will welcome you the lord almighty says i will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters and of course, some people take this to an extreme and say, well, we are to just totally separate ourselves from the world and we just go off and we form a monastery or whatever and we just have just our little group right here. And that's not what's being talked about. 
It's talking about where we make our, our associations. In other words, <clears throat> you, you don't go down and spend all your time in the, a bar room. Even if you're, if you're a Christian, you don't go down and spend all your time in the bar room and associate with those people all the time and make them your friends all the time. Ultimately, it will lead you away, whether you think it would or not, it will. And, but we are, have the responsibility of going into the world. We have the responsibility of going out and teaching individuals, and we have to associate with those that are in the world. But we, we cannot just make that our total involvement is just with the world. And so Paul tells us that we need to separate ourselves, and we need to form our, a lot of relationships between Christians where we get the right kind of encouragement and, and uplifting. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, another part of self-control. Brothers and sisters, in view of all that have been shared about God's compassion, I encourage you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices dedicated to God and pleasing to Him. This kind of worship is appropriate for you don't become like the people of this world. Instead, change the way you think. Then you will always be able to determine what God really wants, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. In other words, we, have to, we are a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice, we are to give ourselves to God. But when you think about sacrifice, sacrifice requires a variety of things. Sacrifice is constant, it's dependable, and it is, in addition to those things, it's dedicated, and it's when and wherever. If something doesn't cost you anything, it can't be a sacrifice. If I give you something that I have received for free, is that a sacrifice? If I give you something that I don't really want, is that a sacrifice? I had, growing up, I had friends that were members of a particular church. And every year they were required to, uh, during Lent, they were required to give up something. Every one of them always gave up something that they didn't do anyway. That was their sacrifice for that period of time. Now, and that's the way a lot of people look at this passage of Scripture. Uh, I'll make a sacrifice myself to the Lord. I'll be a living sacrifice, but only as long as it's convenient. As only as long as it will fit into my scheme of things. In other words, Pharaoh could have said the same thing. You know, I'll obey the Lord if it fits my desires. If it fits in with how I want it to be, then I'll be willing to sacrifice. I'll be willing to let the Israelites go provided God does such and such for me. That could have been Pharaoh's thinking. I don't think the scriptures say that, but that's the kind of thought process we go through. That I will be a Christian as long as it doesn't cost me anything that I want it to be. I put in the both in this time in the comments that I made that your faith is as strong as whatever it takes to keep you away from services or serving the Lord. That's how strong your faith is. If anything that comes up that you would rather do than come to church is, is what you do, then that is more important than worshiping the Lord. That's, that determines your level of faith. And we can see that easy enough. The reality is, in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, you were bought with a price. So bring glory to God in every way you use your body. Everything we are to do is supposed to glorify God. You were bought with a price. No one forced you to become a Christian. No one forces you. You make that choice on your own. The, the requirement is, when you make the choice, that you sacrifice yourself. That's the price you pay. You then agree to do what God wants you to do. Not what you choose to do, what God wants you to do. And when we do what we want to do in place of what God wants to do, we are exercising self-control. We are controlling ourselves. 
but we're controlling ourselves in a way that is in opposition to God. So we have to think about that. And finally, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. In other words, the eternal things basically are things that you don't see. And one of the things that I tend to see in this is that what is eternal is written within you. It's unseen. But whatever that is that's there is what, what we really are. And so we have to look at ourselves. We have to consider whether or not what is seen there is what's truthful and what is right. So God makes his own decisions. He decides what's right and what's wrong. I don't have the right to question that. If God says that's the way he wants it, then that's the way he wants it. It's not, it's no debate. There's no room for it. There was no, never a provision made for it. Pharaoh had a choice. He made his choice. We have a choice. We make our choice. God does what is right. He sets the standards. And what he says and what he wants is right. Whether we agree with it or not doesn't matter. What he says is right. And that's what we have to accept. And we have to accept that when we don't do what he says, we are wrong. We're just like Pharaoh. We are stubborn and we harden our hearts and we, we react against God. And so a sacrifice costs us something. The question is, what has it cost you to be a Christian? And only you can answer that. <coughs> Every time we come to the close of our service, we offer an invitation that you might make your confession of your belief in Christ, might be buried with him in baptism or immersion, raised to walk in a new life, that you change the course of your life and live it according to what God's word says. You have that opportunity. Or if you're in need of the prayers of the church in your behalf, as James 5 tells us, we pray for you, and God has promised that he will answer those <coughs> prayers and that he will forgive us. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation today, we ask you to take control of your own life and make your decision for the Lord. Please come while we stand and sing. What can wash away my 